Wait, wait till I get there. Huh? That's right. That's right, brother. That's right. My God, my God. My God, my God. I told you, if you're going to cut up like that, we'll send you back out for two more weeks and bring you back. I told him yesterday, yesterday morning, in intercessory prayer. You're going to pray like that. We'll send you home for two more weeks and come bring you back. My God, my God. Wait till I get there. Wait till I get there. <laughs> mm, I thank God. I thank God. Please remember whatever you can do in the next four weeks um, to be a blessing. Because when we started with the well, the Lord said four weeks. And, and God allowed us to, be, to, to build a well in Mozambique. And I got to figure out somewhere to put the frame of the certificate. But we take for granted. Yeah, we do things locally. We do things in our city. We yeah. do things around us. That's right. We do things for individuals who call us right. that we'll never tell anybody about. Right. I tell people all the time, if somebody know we helped you, it'll be on you, not on us. Right. Right. But this is what God says the church is supposed to be about. Yeah. This is what the church originally was formed for, yeah. for the word, yeah. but for the community. Yeah. And the well is something, these shoes, all of these things are things that were coming to my house, but now they come in here too. Because when you think of, I think last week I said the population of Canada, America, and Mexico can you imagine the population of Canada, Mexico, and America walking around with no shoes? And then there's over 200 million more with no shoes. See, the majority of these people look like us. We do what we can. Turn with me this morning to Galatians, if you have a Bible. Anybody in need of a Bible, raise your hand. If you need to have a Bible, if you want to have a Bible, raise your hand. Hey, right there at you. I think you can pick out what you want, the King James, NIV. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Galatians 6. Oh, my, my, my. So good. So good. So good. I know she can't be with us here today, but I thank God that Sister Lisa has left hospitals and facilities and back home. Okay. Our mother, Lena Bolin, requests prayer. She has COVID. It's hard on younger people, but I, Mother Lena's in her 80s, and we're going to pray right now before I read this scripture. Lord God, I thank you for being with your daughter, that she is in her 80s, but she is still your precious baby. And I thank you, Lord God, for healing, Lord God. I thank you for bringing comfort to her lungs, comfort to her body, bringing comfort to her mind, Lord God, trusting in the fact that she knows that you're real, Lord God. I thank you because she is one that spends her mornings with you every single day, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that she is acquainted with your ways and your word and your, Lord God, she prays and talks to you on behalf of others. So we're asking you today to be with her, Lord God, to strengthen her. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you right now by faith for what you're doing. Not just for her, but for her entire family. Mm. We believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Galatians 6, I'll begin with verse... Mm. Mm. I want to go back to one. I was going to go somewhere else, but there's something here that needs to be heard. Brethren... If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. If you know somebody that's messing up, don't put them out there on social media. Don't call nobody. If the spirit of God lives in you, 
Restore them in gentleness. Gentleness is a fruit of the spirit that we're supposed to carry. Because it says here, you better do this because considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. If I talk junk about you, he going to talk about me because I'm going to mess up somewhere. Everybody makes a mistake somewhere at some time. But the important thing is restore them. It's no good to walk by somebody and leave them broken. What good am I if I walk by you and leave you broken? I can sit there all day long and say, I'm going to pray for you. But, but if I touch you, if I hear you, if I let you know that I can relate to what you're going through, I ain't got to put my business in the street to put God's business out there. Right. What's wrong with them? Scared about somebody finding out something. Somebody need to know what God delivered you from when they're going through that you ain't always been the church man. You ain't always been the church lady. You ain't always read the Bible. My God, my God. It says bear one another's burden so to fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. For if anything, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, there's a lot of that going around thinks you're just something because you're nothing. There's a whole lot of that going around. He deceives himself because, see, money don't make you something. Oh, my goodness. How many likes you got don't make you something. Oh, my God. You'll know you're something when you start becoming comfortable with who God has made you to be. You don't have to tell somebody to come up and tell you that you're something else. You can look at the mirror and say, God, I thank you that you know sometimes I mess up, but I thank you for how you've made me. I thank you, Lord God, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That everything that's gone down, Lord God, I still can look in this mirror, Lord God, and say, thank you, God. Ah, each one of us has to examine his own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. This is the word rose. These people that think that you know what, because you saved, they're supposed to drain you and ain't never supposed to do nothing for you. They suppose, you're supposed to be on call for prayer. Anytime they say you need, they need prayer. But if anything happened to you, there is no reciprocity. Come on, somebody. Reciprocity is a big thing with God. So now let me get down to the scripture that I'm going to preach today. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for who well, so whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will, will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Somebody say everlasting life. Everlasting life. And let him not grow weary in well-doing. King James say doing good. Come on. This needs to be in here because you get tired of doing good sometimes. Let's be real now. All right, there's no reciprocity. I get tired of praying for folks. I get tired of giving for folks. I get tired of doing, but God says, and now come on, in due season, in due season, we will reap. In due season, you got to believe that there is something for me that God has set aside for me, amen? And I'm going through a process so that when I get it, I'll have the character to hold on to it. My God, my God, my God. But we can't lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's what's holding some people back. Do good to those of the household of faith. It don't mean if they like you or not. It doesn't matter if they buttered you up. It doesn't matter if they tell you how handsome or how pretty or any of those things. It doesn't matter if they don't look like you, don't even speak your language. But as soon as you figure out that they are of the household of faith, the brotherhood and the sisterhood of who we are in Christ Jesus is supposed to kick in. Amen. Amen. Today's message is the power of waiting. Don't grow weary. The power of waiting. Lord, I thank you for your word today. <laughs> teach me so that I can teach. I thank you for the time that you spent with me this week. But Lord, I need it now to come out of me for the ears and the hearts of your people. 
because it's not about me. Never intended to be about me. But for us who hear your word, that their hearts receive you and receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank y'all. Waiting is the hardest part because process ain't easy. I said the process ain't easy. Process is not easy. It's, it's, it's a lot of people who would probably go straight up vegetarian if they ever visited a meat processing place. <laughs> In all, of, in all of my 10,000 jobs, I, I worked at a, uh, as a, a meat cutter at, at um, a place called Southern Foods many, many, many years ago. But, but people who've never worked in a meat processing place, some people would go straight up vegetarian if you see the process that has to take place for something that you can go and buy and put out there. And see, some of us who are old enough remember those old relatives <laughs> well, chicken didn't come out of store. <laughs> I had a great, great aunt who used to go out there and do. That neck is gone, and I, they, they, they boil it and pluck it and put that stuff on it and burn the, uh, uh. And I'm glad it happened when I was a kid because I was just like, it sure tastes good. The process didn't mess me up. See, there's an outcome that comes through the process, but there's a waiting that has to take place. And the waiting is the hardest part. I said the waiting is the hardest part because the waiting is the power. That's when power is revealed in you. That's when you start discovering that you have a power in you. In the process. In the process. Before I even begin to... Um, Prepare this message last week. I, I started sitting and my imagination took me somewhere. And, and I just imagined, I just like, Lord, this. I imagined this huge place. It wasn't necessarily a building, but it was just this huge, huge place where abandoned blessings were, abandoned promises, answers to prayers, healing, all had names on them. Now, I'm not saying this is something that the Lord showed me. I ain't going to that place. I ain't going to lie on God. It was my imagination just sitting here thinking about those things. Because the Lord says all of that took place because people abandoned the process. There are some things with my name on it somewhere because I abandoned a process. There are answers to prayers that I have not received because I didn't want to wait no more. You notice I said I because I don't want nobody to be, oh God. He looked at me when he said that. <laughs> but this is what we, we, we walk away because waiting gets hard. We walk away when things don't happen like we think it's supposed to happen. We don't understand what waiting is and what waiting actually brings. In the Hebrew, the word waiting, and I know we like to think, they that wait upon the Lord, that, oh, I'm going to sit and wait. I'm going to sit. I'm going to tarry as long as I got. In the Greek, wait to wait is to stay. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay in the promises of God. I'm going to stay in the word of God. I'm going to stay with God. Amen. But in the Hebrew, waiting means intertwining intertwining in the Hebrew waiting means that it's almost like braiding up something that you don't know where one thing ends and the other thing begins and one thing ends and the other thing begins God says that's what I want you to gain power from that you don't know if it's you or it's me says so some things that I want to work out through you that when people look at you they're going to be looking at you. They're going to be seeing me because you waited on me and you're intertwined in me. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. Waiting on me and I'm just sitting on a seat to do nothing. Waiting is the process where I gain power. Waiting is the process where I gain knowledge. Waiting is the process where my old failures come and sit down and tell me how not to fail the next time. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Waiting means that I'm going to stay the course no matter how hard the course gets. And the beauty of waiting 
is the anticipation of the process. See, I didn't get in the process not thinking that nothing, wasn't nothing going to happen. Oh, my God. I had something in my mind that I wanted. I saw something that wasn't there. That's what hope is. That's what hope is. That thing that that's, it's, it's, it's evident, but it's not seen. So that's why when the Lord was talking to me about this and I was just sitting there and I was rocking, I was like, Lord, I don't know why I keep seeing this, this huge, huge place. And in my mind, it actually looked like some kind of humongous facility. And I couldn't see the blessings because my imagination ain't that strong, I guess. But it was just saying that blessings, there's names on that. Healing, there's names on that. Deliverance, there's names on it. Miracles. Miracles. My God, when are we going to learn that miracles are a collaborative effort? <clears throat> We're so quick to want to sit. Oh, Lord, my miracle going to come. Get up and do something. Get up and do something. The Bible teaches that faith without works is what? Amen. Come on, some y'all know that better. Than faith without work is what? Amen. So I got to work my faith in order for my faith to bring me to the end of the place that I'm hoping for. Amen. Amen. See, because this process is a period of time. Process is a period of time and a series of actions. And see, we don't like that. I'm supposed to go to work and get off at a certain time. That long-winded preacher keep us in there too long because church ain't supposed to last no more than an hour. <laughs> but this is the way we are, are conditioned to think. Everything has a start time and an end time, but God says my process has no start time and end time because the scripture says it leads you to everlasting life, and everlasting means that there is no time no more, amen? And when you accepted Jesus Christ as your uh, Lord and Savior, you stepped into everlasting. You still on earth, but you step into everlasting. When you accepted him, listen to what I said, not just a savior, not to get out of hell free card, but I accepted him as Lord of my life. Yeah. Yeah. I stepped into everlasting right then. Everlasting began then because I began to receive the benefits of everlasting here on earth. Oh, I'm talking to somebody who wants to hear me this morning. Amen. Amen. The process is a series of actions that involve progressive steps. Progressive steps. You got to keep moving forward. You got to keep moving. You got to keep moving. I don't know. Sometimes um, when I look back on how different things were many years ago, when I had problems with when I first discovered problems with my back, they would send me home. And I was in my mid 30s. Say, here, take these pills and go to bed for two weeks. Later on, when I had back surgery, they came in two or three hours after the surgery and said, get up and walk. I was like, what? Are y'all crazy? Get up and walk. I've learned over the years that as bad as my arthritis flares up, the best thing for it is to move. When the devil is on the attack, the best thing to do is move. When things are starting to go wrong, I can't sit there and cry and whine and pout about it. I got to do what? Move. Because, see, if I'm moving, I am making progress because I refuse to sit there and take what was happening to me. I refuse to receive it like I deserve this. I receive this and I can't do no better and life ain't going to get no better. I'm moving. I ain't got nothing but linen in my pocket, but I don't need it. I don't need to have nothing in my pocket to be rich because God will supply all my need. I said, God will supply all my need. Amen. Amen. See, I got in trouble when my pocket got fat because my head got fat. And I started making dumb thoughts, dumb ideas, dumb moves. Amen. Amen. What was that I heard somebody say a long time? Making money moves. <laughs> money moves get you in trouble when you're saved. Amen. <laughs> you better leave that to the unsaved. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. But God says there's a method of reaching the desired result that you're looking for. See, first of all, we got to let God tell us and show us the desires of our heart. He said, but I'm going to get you there. I'm going to get you there. There's a payoff 
to what you're going through. That's a payoff to what you're going through. That's why you, you can't give up. You can't lose heart. You can't throw in the towel. It doesn't matter how long it's going to take. It's not, listen to what I'm saying to you. It took Abraham 25 years to birth the promise. Now, he believed God and his faith was accorded to him as righteousness, as the Bible says. He had righteousness, but it took 25 years for him to learn to walk in righteousness. God was not going to bless him with the promise so he could mess up the promise. Mm. Because, see, otherwise he would have taught Isaac the wrong way. See, he was trying to do this thing according to custom and according to his flesh and according to his wife and according to everything else. And he get hemmed up, and every time he get hemmed up, he tell a lie. Oh, come on, somebody. He get him up, he tell a lie. Let me show you something. But Isaac learned from his daddy. Isaac would have never learned to hear God. Isaac would have never learned to trust God. And it's, it's in uh, uh, Genesis, let's see what this is. Genesis 26, real quick. It was something that I just saw earlier. Genesis 26, write them down. It says in one, it says, and there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him. Now, if you don't know God, you don't know what God looked like. If you've never heard God, you don't know the voice that's speaking to you. Come on, somebody. He learned that from his father because when he was a kid, a teenager, when he was in his late teens and his daddy walked him up the hill, he carried the wood because his father says that we're going to come back down. Even though that I got this knife and even though that I have been asked to sacrifice you, my son, that boy learned faith from his father because his father spoke faith over his life. Amen. Amen. We got to learn to speak faith over these young people's lives. We got to be able to speak faith over their lives. Even glory to God, if it's going against everything that's a part of our natural, natural reasoning, we got to learn to speak faith. Amen? Amen. And when you speak faith, quit putting it on the clock. The Lord told him, don't go down to Egypt. Live in the land that I should tell you. You dwell in this land and I'll be with you and I'll bless you. For to you and your descendants, I give all these lands. But listen, listen, all of that aside, let's go over to verse 12. And Isaac sold in this land, in the famine. Come on, Elder, you know what I'm talking about. He sold in the famine, in the land that God told him to stay with, in the place that God told him to stay with, and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. I said reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. No. The hundredfold was not even the end of the blessing. He reaped on what he had done. He reaped because he moved. Mm, somebody hear me in here. He reaped because he moved. He didn't sit down and say, well, Lord, times are hard. I guess I ain't going to have nothing until times pick up. And he moved. He moved by faith. He sowed by faith. He heard the Lord. So he reaped because he moved. And then the Lord blessed him. Somebody say amen. 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 That's a payoff. There's a payoff on the way. There's a payoff on the way. In, in Luke this is something that I want us to see. Jesus said this. Jesus says in Luke 16. This is this one little scripture here. And this one little scripture had me just running. 16 and 12. And it's talking about money. It's talking about stuff. And it says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? The waiting. The waiting. The waiting. There is not a business owner that didn't have to learn how to work for somebody else. There's not an entrepreneur that did not have somebody that was a role model. You have to look at what somebody else has accomplished and see if you can be faithful over that thing. See, that's the only way that I can learn to be trusted is when I'm trusted with somebody else. Come on, come on. If I can't be trusted over your $10, what am I going to do with $10,000 of my own? 
except condemn myself to something that I can't get out of. Come on, come on, come on. This is what the scripture is saying. Jesus is telling, he was telling his boys, he says, you know what? When you learn how to bless the resources of others. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about Godly Faith Christian Center. Godly Faith Christian Center is blessed to be a blessing to others because Godly Faith Christian Center has always trusted in the Lord from the day we began. We wanted to bless the community. My God, we could have had a bigger building. We could have had a whole lot of things, but that's not the direction that God said. Every time fish fry, we ate. Every time there was burgers and chicken, we ate. Because we trusted in the Lord and we moved according to the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You have to learn how to make sure that you're taking care of the small resources that you have. You have to make sure that, look here, I'm looking at what somebody else has and they're entrusting me. They're entrusting me. Come on, somebody. And that's it's not always money. Listen, somebody is entrusting me with a secret. Oh, I want to hear. I want somebody to hear me. Somebody is entrusting me with an issue in their life. Somebody is entrusting me with with a brokenness that's inside of them. Somebody is entrusting me. So how will I ever get to the place of figuring out my own mess if I'm going to mess over them while they're going through? This is what God wants us to see. This is the waiting and the power that comes from waiting and the strength that's gained from our waiting. Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor, this is the process. Because every time I act like a fool with earthly things, how in the world am I going to act different over spiritual things? Because it's just a thing. It don't mean nothing. Process gives power. Simple things that, that the Lord showed me in Mark 4. Mark 4. And when we read it in the Bible, we, we, we act like, well, this happened one day and this happened the next day. But in Mark 4 and 35. Jesus was with the disciples and on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Let's cross over to the other side. A storm came. You know the story. The waves beat the boat. They start hollering and crying. Don't you care? Lord, don't you care? I can't pay my rent. Lord, don't you care that she walked out on me? Lord, don't you care? I'm sick. Lord, don't you care? Because there's something beating up against your boat. Something beating up against you. And we grow fearful. We grow fearful because we don't know what's going to happen next. And Jesus was with them, but he wasn't moving the way they expected that a Savior would move. He laid there. But let me go all the way through this because y'all know the story. In 5 and 1 it says, then they came to the other side. That's it. No matter what you're going through, you're going to come to the other side. Now, let me show you the growth right here in 6 and 45 in the same gospel of Mark. 6 and 45. Immediately, he made his disciples go into the boat and go before him. Go before him now. I'm not with you now. I'm telling you what to do. Come on, somebody. This is what the process does. Now, I needed Jesus to hold my hand. Now, I got to trust that Jesus is holding my hand when I can't see him. When I first came to Jesus, I could just let my Bible fall open and the scripture would be right there. Now I got to trust that the Holy Spirit will lead me to the scripture that helps me calm my mind down. When I first came to Jesus, there were people who would pour into my life and give me the things that I needed at that moment. So then now, later on, I have to now go and trust that the Lord will not only send me, but send somebody. So that while I'm going to be a blessing to somebody else, along the way, I'll receive what I need. That when my body is sick, when I'm praying for your sickness, I'll be healed. Amen. And when my children and grandchildren are going crazy, I'll be praying for your, I come to the altar for your children and grandchildren and my children and grandchildren will be delivered. Amen. 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 Somebody say process, baby. Process. <laughs> now Jesus sent them. He sent them. 
And it says now on the same day, on the same day, in the same night, on the third watch, it was three o'clock in the morning. It was evening when they started. Shouldn't have taken but an hour. I said it shouldn't have taken but an hour. But now, listen, they have gained enough confidence that they're still fighting. They are still fighting the storm. They have learned to fight in the storm because Jesus says, I'll meet you on the other side. They have learned to fight in the storm. They didn't even look at the fact that I might perish. Jesus said he's going to meet me on the other side. Somebody got to go back and remind themselves that Jesus said that he will meet me on the other side. It don't look good right now, but Jesus says that he'll meet me on the other side. Amen. And before they could become overcome with what was going on, Jesus showed up and started walking. And the Bible says he almost walked past them. Walking on the water. Walking on cancer. Walking on heart disease. Come on. He's walking on cancer. He's walking on heart disease. He's walking on diabetes. He's walking on AIDS. He's walking on COVID. He's walking. He's walking. He's walking on addiction. He's walking on alcoholism. He's walking on poverty. Come on, somebody. He's walking. And before you get so freaked out, he'll walk. He ain't going to walk past you. He'll get in the boat with you. He'll get in there with you. Amen. And the Lord had me to do that, to bring this back, to, to show us that there's not another storm recorded. It's not to say storms didn't happen, but there's no need to record it no more. See, because I conquered that in Christ Jesus. I went from crying, Lord, where you at? To Lord, I heard your promise. To Lord, now I ain't going to worry about it. Come on, somebody. See, the process got me to the place, Lord, I can't worry about it. Lord, I can't worry about it. I had some things go on one time, and I said, Lord, do I need to call the EMTs, or do I just need to? And then I finally got to a place, Lord, whatever you want to do, if these are my last hours, okay. And I know people say, that sounds crazy. No, if you've been what God has brought me through, if you've seen what God has brought me through, where I wanted to live, but I was living to die, so I can't worry about anything that's happening now because at that time I was living to die and God was working double time on my life. Grace was working to keep me alive. So now that I am standing in everlasting in the promises of God in Christ Jesus, why am I going to worry now because my heart flutters? Huh? They didn't have any more storms after that that needed to be recorded. There are some things now that don't need to be recorded no more in your life. There's some things in your life don't need to be talked about no more. There's some things that don't need to be brought up no more. There's some things that, look, that's when people want to come up and tell you how scared you used to be. That's all right. That was then. This is now. When people want to come up and tell you how messed up you used to act. That's all right. To God be the glory. That was then. This is now. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Somebody want to bring you back. Bring you back. And God says, I'm taking you forward. Amen. I'm taking you forward, but the steps are so incremental sometimes, we don't see the growth that's taking place. We don't see the power we're gaining. They were still called disciples. They were not called apostles until much later because it wasn't time yet. They had to wait. They had to wait. They had to turn and run from him. They had to be scared. They had to stand in disbelief when Mary came and told them that he had risen. They have to go through a whole lot of phases inside of who they were before they could come to the understanding of what he said, I'm going to make you into be. He said, the whole thing was I was going to make you fishers of men. Not apostles, I, mean, I was going to make you fishers of men. Not give you a title where everybody can gloat about it. No, I, I was going to give you a different job. Oh, my God, my God. Process is difficult and it's scary. It's difficult and it's scary. Oh, my God. But he will continue to keep us. He will continue to keep us. Oh, my God. If we will continue to walk with him. Mm. But this is the thing that God wanted me to share when I go back to Galatians. That we cannot 
we cannot find the success that we desire. I'm not talking about what God wants for us. I said we can't find the success that we desire. When I got God one minute and I'm running with the devil the next. When I got this light switch faith. Will God show up first or somebody come and loan me some money? That brother prayed about accidental faith. We got to quit living in accidental faith. Let me throw some faith out there and see what happens. I ain't sure. Nothing might not work, but I'm going to throw it out there. And if it works, I'm going to say, hallelujah, with my faith. <laughs> Bible said faith is going to go through a fire. Yeah. Said faith has got to be tested. <laughs> said faith has to burn some stuff away. Yeah. Peter out there scared of everything. And the Bible records that after, 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 uh, uh, what you call it, um, Herod had, had killed uh, uh, James, the brother of John. They put Peter in jail. Peter went to sleep. Peter went to sleep, sound sleep. That's faith. That's faith because I know that God's got me and man can't do but so much to me. I know the devil got a plan to hurt me, but God's got me. And my faith says that I've got to lay here because... Staying up all night crying ain't going to help nothing. Whining and talking about why me, Lord, why me? That ain't going to help nothing. The greatest show of faith that Peter had was, I'm going to lay down. Because Peter's the one that jumped up and hollered, don't you care? That was Peter hollering, don't you care? Get up over there. Don't you care about us? Glory to God. Glory to God. See, so many people play with God and get tricked while they're playing tricks and then they get mad and walk away and don't want to fool with God no more. They get tricked playing tricks and then they get mad at God and walk away. And then they talk about the church and God and people and the Bible and everything else. But they got tricked trying to trick God. And the truth of the matter is, there is success that you can gain in this world. There is knowledge that you can gain in this world, great experiences you can have in this world. Come on, let's get real with it. But why not include the knowledge and the success and the gifts and the talents that's already in you with the blessings that come from God? There's no telling how far, farther you can go. How farther, much farther, how much more you could achieve and you could have if you've taken those things that you have and you worked so hard for and then allowed God to come and be a part of it because he don't want to take nothing away from you. He wants to add something to you. And the lie of the devil deceives people into saying that God don't want you to have no fun and don't want you to have no nice things and don't want you to be. And oh, this is a lie of the devil. That's the lie. The richest people that walk the face of the earth, glory to God, some are in the Bible. During biblical times, some of the richest people in the Bible, God's servants in the Bible. I'm talking filthy rich. I'm talking make Elon Musk shine their shoes. Come on, somebody. We're talking about billion dollar offerings. And we sit up and listen to the devil say, oh, you ain't supposed to have too much. What? What? And it's sad because we have had people come and reinforce that ignorance because of their limitations and knowledge because they're scared if you get something. They scared you're going to turn to the devil. Poor people die and go to hell and turn to the devil. So why is it that you're scared of somebody having some money? This is what we've taught from. Generations before me taught from that. Afraid for prosperity to come. Because prosperity is going to Generations long ago wouldn't even teach grace. 
Well, sin abounds, grace abounds much more abundantly. Oh, we can't teach that because that's going to let them go out there and sin. You're going to sin anyway. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> I cannot believe that there are many Christians who look at grace and says, this lets me go and do the wild thing. No, it don't work like that. That's the deception of the devil. Amen. My brother said something the other week. He said, Pastor, he said, Keith, he said, Keith, that's greasy grace right there. That ain't God's grace. That's greasy grace. Amen. Amen. And this is how people get tricked trying to trick God. And the outcome that they were looking for doesn't happen. So now I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to go to the other side. Glory to God. In Galatians 6, verse 7. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. But do not be deceived. Do not let the devil trick you. Stop listening to that voice that tells you that you can outsmart God. You can outsmart Kilgore because Kilgore ain't that smart. But Kilgore ain't never had a heaven or hell to put you in, nor does he have the blessings that God has. He says, starting out, don't be deceived because God is not going to be mobbed. So when you think that you're turning away from God and you're going to talk this nonsense about church and Christianity, Lord God, help them because they're doing themselves a great disservice for their future and for their future loved ones. Listen to what I'm saying. Just like Abraham was able to teach Isaac, parents today and grown-ups today is teaching kids how to mock God. Oh They're teaching them how to not trust God. They teach them, well, you know, them preachers, all them preachers, hey, it don't matter if it's a man or woman, they just have to get the money. They, hey, you're teaching children that because you got tricked trying to trick God. And God ain't the one that tricked you, the devil tricked you. The devil is the one that tricked you because he let you go on and play yourself. And God was talking, but you didn't want to listen because what the devil says sometimes ends up being more what you playing than what God playing. We better get real. We better get real. What the devil says sometimes sounds more like what we planned and what God had planned for us. Come on, let me get this thing done. Jesus. Uh, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Corruption in the Bible was when a person looked out at their field, because we're talking about people dealing with agriculture all throughout the Bible in the New Testament. And, and when the owner of a field would look out all his hard work and says, it's too rotten to even go out and harvest. That's what corruption is. It's too rotten to harvest it. I put in some work and I've invested money and time, but it's too rotten to harvest. You've put in the prayer. You've put in the scripture. You've put in the time with God. But now you want to flip it over and do it in your flesh. And you look out and it's like, this is too rotten to even mess with. And you're mad at God, but God didn't have nothing to do with it because you wanted to do it in your flesh instead of in the spirit because I didn't want to wait. Somebody say, wait. Wait. <coughs> That's why I told you that word wait is to be entwined, to be braided together. I got to wait. I got to wait on the Lord. I got to wait on the Lord. Because otherwise I'm going to look out at all of my work and see that I ain't going to get nothing from it. I'm not going to get nothing from it. And, and it's hurtful that you got to throw away something that you've invested in. That you can't do nothing with that mess. That you can't get nothing out of that mess. And all of that time you put in it. All of that money you put in it. 
all of that work, that back breaking work you've been putting in it and you can't get nothing out of it because you tried to flip it over from the spirit and do it by the flesh alone and you didn't have to because Jesus says I'm with you and the same spirit that dwelt in Jesus now dwells in you so you ain't got to do it by yourself you ain't got to do it by yourself don't be deceived and let the devil tell you you ain't good enough don't be deceived and let the devil tell you you ain't saved enough don't be deceived and let the devil remind you of your sin and tell you what you can't do through the spirit you can do all things I say you can do all things. The same spirit that was in Christ Jesus dwells in those that believe in him. And the devil deceives and says, oh man, I messed up the other day. I messed up the other week. <coughs> so I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to have to go in my flesh and I'm going to have to work extra hard in my flesh to make it happen. And it ain't happening. It ain't happening. He says, no matter what you think and believe. Come on, let's go back to what it says. When he is nothing, anyone thinks of himself to be something when he is nothing. Huh? That's what verse 8, if you think of yourself, you're something. And you, come on, you, you deceived yourself. You deceived yourself. I know it's probably changed now, but, but when I was out there in that world many, many years ago, I said, you're playing yourself. You ain't even got to be played. You playing yourself. That made, that made people so mad when I used to play basketball. Man, we'd be out on the court. And, and God here himself check. I ain't even got to guard him. Self check. You know what I'm talking about, Deacon B. Self check. Leave him alone because he can't do nothing to hurt nobody. <laughs> self check. Why am I going to run over there to him? He can't do nothing. He dribble. He's going to dribble it off his foot. Self check. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about some Christians need to get some skills now because the devil don't even bother run up on you no more. They'll say self-check. They're going to talk themselves out of the miracle before they get to the miracle. They're going to talk themselves out. They, devil ain't even got to tell you why you don't deserve the blessing. You're going to tell yourself why you don't deserve the things of God. Lord, I don't deserve to be healed. You know, I drank that old bad liquor for 20 years and I don't deserve. You're going to tell yourself what you don't deserve. Oh, my God. Ah, let me get this thing back on the rails before I mess up here. But what the scripture is saying in 7 and 8 is that there's nothing that's going to come out of your flesh that's not going to poison the work that you do. There is a poison that comes out of the kind people, the good people, the people who don't walk in sin, the people who have kind hearts because it's the sin nature of who we are that came with Adam. And the second man, Adam, who is Christ Jesus, came to give us a different nature so that we are not bound just to operate in the sin nature of who we are. And that's what that scripture is saying. You don't have to just depend only on your flesh anymore. You don't have to because there's poison that comes out of this self-indulgent flesh. I was coming to church this morning and I said, Lord, why is it speed limit here on 840 says, 65 and I'm doing 80 <laughs> and I didn't have to wait for God to tell me it was just because ain't nobody around to stop you that's the flesh that wasn't nobody out there so the sign says 65 huh that's the poison of the flesh we think that oh it's got to be I, I murdered somebody I went and robbed somebody no there's a poison in us to not do what we're supposed to do merely because we're supposed to do it. Come on now. I'm trying to teach us. I'm trying to teach us this. This is the poison that's, that came from the sin of Adam and Eve. That's been in every human being. You don't have to be some rotten, vile person. But you'll do some things that just because there's nobody around. <laughs> Now, if there was a highway patrolman, I'd back that thing on down and do the right thing. Because now I see authority that can bring something that might harm me. So now I walk in order. Come on, somebody. This is what God wants us to see. He says, I don't want you to have to 
have somebody over you to walk in order. I'm not going to beat you over the head for you to walk in order. I want you to want order. And the only re way you will want order is through the process. Because you will learn order in the process. Paul says, I have learned to be content. Whether I got it or not. Whether it's good or it's bad. I have to learn this. Paul came from an affluent family. One of the most educated men throughout the whole Bible. But he said, I have to learn this. It was a process. A process of suffering. And Lord God, don't talk about suffering and sacrifice in the church. But we don't understand that the greater the sacrifice, the greater the blessing. If you don't want to sacrifice nothing, you ain't going to get very much. That's in all things in life. I was listening to someone the other day talk about food deserts, food deserts, food deserts. I was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I've been black a long time. <laughs> I've been black a long time. And we ain't never had no problem. Somebody cook some greens. <laughs> Somebody cook some cabbage. Somebody cook some green beans. We ain't never had no problem with that. And things were a lot tighter money-wise. Come on, somebody. But now we want to sit back and say, if it's not within reach, it's somebody else's fault. This is the process we got to grow out of. This is the process we have to be delivered from. That's why he says, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary doing good. Do not be weary helping those that get on your nerves. Do not be weary. Your well-doing is for you. We don't get it some, sometimes. We don't get that what I do that helps somebody else. It's more for me than it is for them. But you can't get tired of doing good. You can't get tired of doing good because when you get tired of doing good, your stuff will be stored in that place that I told you about in my imagination. Your miracle is in that place because you got tired of doing good. You were waiting on reciprocity. You were waiting on somebody to do something good for you. And God says, no, you've been waiting for a friend. You've been waiting for a family member. God says, I want your enemy to bless you. But you got to wait until I finish working on the heart of your enemy. Don't get weary in doing good. Glory to God. Don't get weary in doing good. He says, because I got a place prepared for you in the presence of your enemies. Where the anointing is going to be so strong. Glory to God that your cup runs over. You're not half cup, half empty, half full and all these worldly things. Your cup runs over. You can bless your children and your grandchildren, your nieces and your nephews, your cousins and everybody else. Because you've reached a place where your cup runs over. Amen. Amen. Because you didn't get tired. He says, because when due season comes. Hey, you ain't got to have a program and shout. You just sit back and smile. Because due season is not the end of the game. Due season says it's a period of rest and reload. That's where the church misses it. Due season ain't it. I got a house. Okay, so is that the end of the world? I've been praying about this house. Okay, is that the end of life? No, due season comes, so you rest, you reload, and whatever God has brought to you, give it back to him. Give it back to him. Give it back to him. Because the word of God says you're going to reap. He says, listen, he says in the Proverbs that, that when you make your ways right with him, he'll make your enemies be at peace with you. This is due season. 
This is due season. God wants us to understand. This is a part of the process. This is a part of the process. This is what we have to go through. This is why David had to wait 15 years after the promise. Come on, somebody. I want you to understand the process. David had to wait 15 years after the promise of being king. Oh, he could fight. But he didn't know how to lead. He didn't know how to govern. He didn't know how to establish and assemble people around him that could take care of the needs of a nation. We think because the good thing, God didn't take away his ability to fight. Son, them love songs that you write to me, I, I, I'm just, 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 this is just me talking. That God was saying, you, them love songs that you write to me are beautiful, son, but that's not going to help a nation. That's not going to help the northern and the southern kingdom when people are afraid. When they're lacking food, that's not going to help them. Love songs are one. These praises are wonderful. But you have to learn administrative duties. Come on, somebody. We got to take the church out of the silliness of I can shout my way in and shout my way out. Well, what you going to do when you shout your way back out? Because you're going to end up right back in if you didn't learn anything. That's why waiting. It's powerful. There's power in the process. If the word of the Lord has been a blessing to you, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen.